In the last few years, measurements of consumer audio products have become more widely available thanks to sites such as Audio Science Review, Superbest Audio Friends, L7 Audio Lab, and my own site, goldensound.audio, all now having access to high-performance test equipment and putting out measurements of products. With more and more measurements becoming available, consumers have also come to use measurements as an important deciding factor in what product they should purchase, to the extent that some companies such as Shit Audio have even begun releasing products with completely different design philosophies because at the moment, particularly in the more budget market segment, measurements sell a lot more products than subjective feedback does. In this video I'm going to show you, as someone who puts out measurements regularly, a few reasons why measurements shouldn't always be trusted, why you should always take them with a sizable pinch of salt, why you should never treat them as absolutes, and why comparing two sets of measurements, even from the same person, might not be as fair as it seems. I'm going to show you a few ways in which the person doing the measurements can intentionally or unintentionally alter what measurements show to make a product seem better or worse than the competition, or why measuring things in different but equally valid ways can show very different results. And I'll also show you just one way in which a manufacturer can game the system, so to speak, to make their products seem to measure better than competitors, even if it actually doesn't. And lastly, I'll show you a couple side effects that are nearly unavoidable when making a product that seeks to maximize Cyanad above everything else. I wouldn't be able to make this video without the support of my fantastic patrons. You guys are what allowed me to get the analyzer and to make content like this in the first place, and I can't thank you enough. If you, the viewer, would also like to help support more content like this, then please do consider supporting me on Patreon or Subscribestar. You'll get featured in the end cards of future videos and access to the private Patreon chat. There's a ton of fantastic people in there with fantastic gear and fantastic experiences, and I'm super proud of the community that we've got. If you'd like to skip straight to the main content, go to this timestamp, but I just want to quickly clarify a couple things before we start. Firstly, this video is purely for educational purposes. This is not at all intended to come across as directed towards any person or company. And I'm not implying that any person or company is doing things right or wrong, only that there are differences in how things are done, and these differences can be potentially misleading to viewers and consumers if they don't know about them. Secondly, this video is not a subjective versus objective debate. Those who've seen some of my previous videos or spoken to me will know that I have a fairly middle ground view in terms of objective versus subjective. I believe that measurements are important, and looking at them thoroughly can give some interesting explanations as to why we hear certain things subjectively, but I also feel that nowadays some specific measurements are given far too much focus, and products are not tested or evaluated thoroughly enough in many cases. Why should one product be considered better for having better cyanide at 1kHz, even though it might have much worse IMD, jitter, crosstalk, or various other problems, or even just poorer cyanide at a different frequency? This video is not intended to debate how important measurements in general are, it's just intended to show that measurements can look very different for the same device depending on how it's tested, and that measurements are not always fair and equal and are certainly not absolute. So let's get started. The first and most important point to discuss is that two sets of measurements of the same device can be different if the analyzer itself isn't configured in the exact same way. So how do you know how the analyzer and test setup is configured? When you look at websites such as my own or Audio Science Review, you might see something that looks like this. This is a view of part of the audio precision software, which shows some key figures about the device under test and a few important bits of information about the analyzer, such as the configured input impedance, input sensitivity, and bandwidth. But this screen does not show you anything even close to enough, and to demonstrate this, I'm going to alter the measurement shown to make the amplifier that I'm measuring appear to change in performance in the way that I choose. At first, it seems that this amp is very high performing. 121 dB or so Cyanad is excellent and among some of the highest performing devices available. But the measurement isn't static. What is the Cyanad value of this amp? It's not a constant 121, it's flipping between 120 to 122. The Cyanad value depends entirely on when you look, and so when you're comparing the Cyanad values of two products, which is better, can often come down to simply when I take the screenshot. The same applies to other measurements. I can do a linearity test over and over and over, and it'll look different each time because there is a notable degree of randomness to this. Now this is just all run-to-run -run variation, and it's an important factor to keep in mind, but the differences here are small. The next issue is that, as the one doing the measurements, I can nudge things to a significant degree in a particular direction, and you'd never know unless I told you. Let's bump up the performance of this amp slightly. Note how nothing here at the bottom has changed, and I've not touched the physical device either, all I've done is change one particular setting on the analyzer. I can even nudge it up again, and now it looks like we have one of the best measuring amps on the planet in our hands. I can also move it the other way, 
If I reset this setting so that it goes back to where we were, and I change something else, now our performance takes quite a hit, and you can even visibly see that the harmonics have risen notably. I can change yet another setting, and once again, performance drops down, now at a level that compared to a lot of products on the market would be considered somewhat mediocre. We've gone from around 125 dB sine to about 110, so which number is correct? Well, all of them are, and which is correct depends entirely on what you feel is the fairest way to set things up. If I were testing this device in the same way that I normally measure things, then the value would be about 121 dB. But this shows that I can change the apparent performance of this device to look better or worse, and the viewer would not know a thing unless I disclosed to them that I'd changed something. Even myself, looking at measurements provided by others, I often don't know how they have their test setup configured, and I can't guarantee that my own measurements are fair to compare to theirs, because not enough information has been provided about how they're testing things. So what did I change in this instance? This is the full Benchmo dashboard of the Audio Precision software, and as you can see on the left, there is a myriad of configuration options. Perhaps the most important setting here is the bandwidth. The bandwidth determines the frequency range that the analyzer is actually looking at, and you can set this all the way up to about 1.2 MHz, though you'd very rarely, if ever, want to do so, purely because we're humans. We can't hear past about 20 kHz. And so when calculating THD plus N or Synad, factoring in noise at 500 kHz makes no sense, because we can't hear it anyway. We're interested in the audible band between 20 Hz and 20 kHz, so there's a few settings here that might make sense. Amir from Audio Science Review typically sets his analyzer to run at 48 kHz, and AP labels this bandwidth as 22.4 kHz. Theoretically, this would have a maximum bandwidth of 24 kHz, but depending on the filter design, it might be a bit less. You can also set the ADC to run at 44.1 kHz, or I personally use the 20 kHz cutoff filter, given as this is the cutoff for the audible band. All three of these options are pretty valid, but they will produce slightly different results, because if you use 48 kHz, you'll be factoring in some amount of noise above 20 kHz that you wouldn't be if you were using the lower sample rate or the 20 kHz cutoff filter. So it's important to check the bandwidth of the analyzer, because they need to be the same if you want to make a direct comparison. Next, measurements can be taken with various weighting settings. Now myself, Audio Science Review, L7 Audio Lab, Marv at Superbest Audio Friends, and many others will normally provide unweighted measurements. However, many manufacturers will often base their specs on A-weighted measurements, which applies less weighting to high and low frequency content in order to, in theory, make the result more applicable to the human hearing sensitivity curve. And also because it almost always results in a higher number and therefore looks more impressive on a spec sheet. You cannot compare an A-weighted measurement to an unweighted measurement, so be careful when look at manufacturer-listed specs. If they're given as A-weighted, you can't compare them to measurements from Amir, myself, or anyone else. I can change the weighting further to C-weighting to knock things up even higher. But let's set this back to unweighted for now and talk about how I made things look worse. And again, throughout all of this, nothing on this section of the screen would give the viewer any indication that anything had changed. You're relying entirely on the transparency of the one doing the measurements. The next thing I changed was how the analyzer was actually measuring the incoming signal. ADCs, or analog to digital converters, have harmonic distortion of their own. So even if you put the absolute cleanest 1 kHz tone into the analyzer, it would show some harmonic distortion due to the limitation of the analyzer itself. And so a clever method of ensuring that the ADC in the analyzer does not impact the measurement result is to filter out the test tone itself, and just record the harmonics and noise from the device being tested. If there's no 1 kHz tone getting to the ADC, it can't add any harmonics. The APX555's high-performance sine analyzer does just this, applying a very steep notch filter at the exact frequency of the test tone to filter it out, meaning the ADCs now see only the remaining harmonics and noise, and they don't add any harmonics of their own because there's no meaningful level of that test tone present. It then measures the full signal on a separate ADC and combines them digitally to provide the view we see in the top right. If I turn this high-performance sine analyzer off, then the ADC's own harmonic distortion adds to the measurement result, and so it appears worse, even though this is not actually the fault of the device we're testing at all. Next, as we're measuring an amplifier, the signal itself is provided by the analyzer, output to the amp, and then back into the analyzer for analysis. Therefore, the analyzer needs to make sure that it's providing as clean a signal as possible, else the measurement will be limited by the analyzer's own performance, not the amp. If you put a bad signal in, you'll get a bad signal out, even on the world's best amp. 
The APX555 has an analog sine wave generator called the High Performance Sine Generator, which provides an exceptionally low distortion sine wave for testing devices. But it also has an internal DAC for playing back arbitrary waveforms such as noise or multitone tests. If I switch to this DAC converter, the harmonic distortion of the outgoing signal itself is inherently higher than the High Performance Sine Generator, and so our performance drops, again through no fault of the amplifier at all. And lastly, even if all analyzer configuration settings are exactly the same and these figures at the bottom aren't being affected, we can still affect what we see visually in this window up here by changing the FFT settings. Using a higher point FFT will make the noise floor appear lower, even though actually it hasn't changed. This is one reason why you should never use FFT to try and judge the noise floor of a device. These are a few examples of how the person doing the measurements can influence the result either positively or negatively, simply by configuring their analyzer slightly differently, and that without information about the configuration, the viewer would never know. In order to fairly compare measurements, you need to ensure that the analyzer was set up the same, otherwise it could be slightly or completely misleading and unfair. To alleviate this issue, sites like L7 Audio Lab provide screenshots of the full dashboard, not just this right-hand section. And this shows most of the important settings so that you can verify his measurements were done fairly and consistently. And on my website, I provide full reports, which are generated by the software after running my measurement sequence. These contain information detailing exactly how the analyzer was configured and how the test parameters were set up for every measurement and every signal path. If you'd like to skip to the part where I tell you about how a manufacturer can influence things, then go to this timestamp. But if you'd like to know a few DAC and AMP-specific quirks, then watch on. Amps. I've connected a headphone amplifier to the analyzer, and I'm playing a 1 kHz test tone. I'm now going to show you that I can change the performance of this amp without touching the analyzer or the amp at all. See how the cyanide dropped? And we now have additional distortion visible on the FFT as well. If our configuration is the same, and the amp hasn't been adjusted, what's happened? Which of these numbers is fair? Well, again, the answer is both. What I changed in this instance was an element of the test setup that is not shown in any screenshot, the dummy load. When testing a headphone amplifier, a dummy load is used to simulate the impedance of a headphone. When I switch from an easier 300 ohm load to a more difficult 32 ohms, the amplifier is required to supply more current, and therefore performance drops. The impedance shown at the bottom right here is the input impedance of the analyzer, not the dummy load, and therefore it doesn't change. Because of this, I could show you measurements of two amplifiers, one of which was clearly better than the other. But unless you know that these are indeed both measured with the same load, it's not fair to compare them at all, and I could make either one look better than the other. Measurements with easier loads will look better than those with more difficult ones. Personally, my way of combating this is simply to provide full reports for various load impedances, so that you can always compare not only fairly, but with whatever load value closest represents your own headphones. Another issue is that it's quite unlikely you're going to be pumping several volts through your headphones. Something like a Haifaman Aria, which is a moderately hard to drive headphone, needs only a quarter of a volt to get to 90 dB, and IEMs will often only need in the area of 50 millivolts. Because of this, it's useful to measure an amp's performance at real-world levels, where it will reflect what a user is going to experience. And measuring at 2 volts or 4 volts might show poor performance that doesn't actually matter, because you wouldn't be using it that high anyway. When measuring an amplifier's performance at these lower but more applicable to real-world levels, there are two ways to do it. The first is that you can simply lower the output voltage of the analyzer into the amp, so that the output from the amp is at the correct level. This makes automating testing a lot easier, and you can be very precise, but if you do it the way that a real-world user would, by keeping the fixed 2-volt input from their DAC, for example, and adjusting the pot or volume knob on their amp, performance can sometimes be different. So which of these is the best way to do it? Again, there's no correct answer. Both of these numbers are from genuine signals coming from the amp, just different ways of using it. It depends on what the person doing the testing feels is fairest. On one hand, you could skew things, as getting an amp to output exactly 50 millivolts with a pot is not particularly easy. So comparisons might be based on different output levels between amps, or even imbalanced channels on the same amp, which is inherently unfair. But on the other hand, this is a much more accurate to real-world use, and testing the amp this way will show what a user is likely to experience, and may reveal performance impacts of the volume adjustment in an amp that wouldn't otherwise be shown. For this reason, I personally always test amps at 700 millivolts to represent a loud headphone listening level, and 50 millivolts to represent IEMs. 
I do also include a 4 volt Unity gain test to compare to other sites like ASR if desired, but I do want to stress that I personally don't feel this is particularly applicable to the real world. In all cases, I do this by inputting a standard 4V balanced or 2V RCA if it's a single-ended device, and adjusting the pot as close as I can to the desired output level manually. A somewhat similar issue can be encountered with DAX. Traditionally, XLR line voltage has been about 4 volts, but recently we've seen quite a lot of DAX with hotter output levels of 5V or sometimes even higher. How do you fairly compare these two? The 5V output DAC may have an advantage simply by nature of having a higher output level, which arguably makes the comparison unfair. But then, a real-world user isn't going to attenuate their DAC down to exactly 4 volts, they'll just plug it in and go. So you can easily make the counter-argument that you should just measure the DACs with their native output level. Audio Science Review tests DACs by normalizing to 4 volts to make sure that things can be compared directly, which is a perfectly valid way of doing it. I personally measure DACs at their native output levels, because I feel that that's more like how someone would actually use the device. Both methods are valid, with pros and cons, but that doesn't mean that you can't make a direct comparison between Amir's measurements and my own. Speaking of DACs, let's talk about some of the challenges when measuring those. DACs have all sorts of things that can influence the measured performance. Many DACs are quite susceptible to noise from the host device, and so even a small laptop can negatively impact measurements, let alone a powerful and noisy gaming PC, which is probably just about the worst device you could introduce into an audio chain. The source you're using when doing the measurements can impact the measurement results, either for reasons like it having noisier USB outputs, more ground plane noise, or even more obscure issues like an ungrounded, battery-powered laptop having a potential difference on the USB ground and needing to be grounded to the analyzer or other parts of the setup manually. An easy solution to both of these would be something like the Intona 7055C Galvanic Isolator, which I use for most testing, but it's not a silver bullet. The market is surprisingly full of USB cleanup devices, reclockers and filters and isolators, and many of them do genuinely have an impact. The Intona, for example, even on quite high-end DACs such as the Gustard X26 Pro, can demonstrably reduce noise and improve jitter performance. But, by nature of it being a galvanic isolator, it also means that the USB connection is no longer grounded, and so for DACs where they rely on a USB ground, they can actually cause more harm than good. Because of this, I often have to measure DACs both with and without isolation to check which situation they work best in. Though in 90% of cases, I use the isolator as it provides either no change or a slight improvement. But even ignoring differences in the physical test setup, there are also configuration issues on the DAC which can once again make measurements show differently without the viewer ever knowing that anything was configured differently, unless you told them. One good example is the jitter performance of a DAC. Right now I'm playing a JTest file on the SMSL SU9N. The JTest is designed to show jitter through the actual analog output of a DAC. We can see that the jitter on this DAC is exceptionally low, but if I change one setting on the DAC itself, not the analyzer, suddenly things don't look so pretty. What I changed here was the PCM reconstruction or oversampling filter. A prerequisite for the JTest is that you use a sharp cutoff Nyquist filter. So if I use a slower filter, which some DACs may have by default, then jitter appears to be much worse, even though actually it hasn't changed. You can see this effect very clearly on a non-oversampling DAC, where no filter is used at all, such as the Rockner Wavedream, where jitter appears to be quite poor in NOS, but much better when oversampling is enabled. The level of jitter has not actually changed, the test was just not being conducted properly. And once again, unless I had told you what filter the DAC was using at the time, you'd never have known that this was my fault, and would have been given the impression that the product was performing poorly. Another situation which also impacts jitter is the source itself. Here, I'm feeding the SU9N via coaxial SPDIF from the analyzer. On the APX555, I can actually deliberately add jitter to the digital output to simulate a poor quality digital source. The actual data, the ones and zeros, is still absolutely identical, there's no issue there but the timing of transmission is not. And so when I do this, we can see that the jitter performance of the DAC is made worse. This shows that if someone were testing a DAC with something like optical SPDIF from their PC, it could well have a negative impact on performance and wouldn't be fair to compare those measurements to ones from a higher quality source like a high performance DDC. And without changing any analyzer settings, I can now reduce this jitter by increasing the strength of the PLL jitter attenuation system on the DAC yet another factor to consider. And lastly, some DACs might have slightly different performance depending on what sample rate you're feeding them with. A common cause here is that it's harder to divide the 48MHz USB rate into 44.1kHz than it is into 48kHz, 
and so many DACs have higher levels of jitter on 44.1 kHz than they do on 48 kHz. And some DACs just have different structures of harmonic distortion depending on the sample rate as well. These are all test configuration aspects that are not shown anywhere in the software screenshot, and the viewer is once again relying on the transparency and consistency of the person doing the testing. To make sure that the measurements are fair and on an even playing field to compare with others, or that they are applicable to real world use. There are simply so many factors to consider when testing devices, and so many test conditions that can all be considered fair and valid, but will produce different results. And so for that reason, when looking at measurements, always consider that they are not an absolute value, and that the device being tested is, ironically, only part of the equation. Manufacturers. The person doing the testing is not the only one that can influence the measurements you see. With a good understanding of what tests will be conducted and how the APX555 itself works, a manufacturer can make specific optimizations to give themselves an edge over the competition. Sometimes this isn't intentional. For example, many DACs and amplifiers will have pretty good synad at 1 kHz, but then as soon as you look at higher frequencies, you'll see distortion getting much worse. This isn't something specific the manufacturer has done to cheat the measurement or hyper-optimize for 1 kHz test conditions and mislead users, it's just that not all devices have even distortion across all frequencies, and so this in itself is a very important measurement to check. A lot of devices, for example, that are generally considered to be quite warm sounding, even though on a graph like this they may seem to be very clean, can potentially be explained simply by increasing harmonics into the high frequencies. But sometimes a manufacturer can make a deliberate design choice that gives them an edge in measurements. Here's an example. When doing a measurement, you'll always to some degree be limited by the measurement system itself, as the analyzer doesn't have infinite performance. The APX555 is currently the highest performing in this regard, but still there is a performance limit. Now, XLR line voltage is traditionally 4 volts, and so if we do a quick test of the analyzer's own sign generator at 4 volts, looped back to the inputs, we get a sign out value of about 121 dB. But if we up it to 5 volts, now we get about 123. The generator hasn't suddenly gotten more accurate, it's just that it's now much closer to the input sensitivity of 5 volts, and therefore the limitation of the analyzer's own dynamic range is less of a factor. We can show this by turning off auto sensitivity and manually increasing the input range from 5 volts to 10 volts. And now we see performance drop, because there is more headroom to the upper limit of the input sensitivity range, and so we are being limited by the analyzer's own performance to a greater extent. We can see this behavior on the THD plus N versus level graphs of various analyzers, where performance does not remain static and jumps about as the input sensitivity adjusts. Therefore, devices with bleeding edge performance can make themselves appear to be just a little better than the competition if they can get as close as possible to the upper limit of one of the analyzer's input sensitivity ranges. The APX555 actually switches over to the next input sensitivity range at just over 5.3 volts. So if a manufacturer were to design their DAC with an output level just below this, say 5.2 volts, they'd be able to squeeze out every last bit of dynamic range from the analyzer itself getting maybe 124 dB if you took the screenshot at the right time. And they'd appear to measure better than the competition, even though performance may not actually be any better. They're just gaming the system based on knowledge of this specific test setup to make it look better on this particular analyzer. And some manufacturers do indeed take advantage of this. The topping D90SE, for example, has an output voltage of, you guessed it, 5.2 volts. Now, the D90SE is still a very high-performing DAC, and I'm not speaking negatively here about it. In fact, in order to do this trick, the device does need to be very close to the upper performance limit of the analyzer anyway. But it's just an example of how a manufacturer can optimize a product in ways that are designed to make it look better, not actually necessarily perform better. This is more of an issue when some sites like ASR are ranking products based on the single metric of Synad. Manufacturers will therefore sacrifice quality in other areas as long as they can squeeze out that last little bit of Synad. 1 or 2 dB can make the difference between being at the top of ASR's chart and selling plenty of your product because of it, or being beat by multiple others and left behind. But what kind of sacrifices might I be talking about? Surely higher Synad is just better, right? Well, there are plenty, but one good example of it is intersample overs. The vast majority of DACs are oversampling, meaning they take the 44.1 kHz information you give them, and they oversample to a much higher rate adding extra samples to interpolate and reconstruct the intended original waveform. The reasons and methodology behind this is beyond the scope of this video, but what's important is that this can carry some challenges. Digital information has a maximum limit. For 16-bit, 
0 dBFS, or full-scale maximum output, would be represented by all 16 bits being a 1. We can guarantee that the PCM information being fed to the DAC won't exceed this limit because it's not possible. You can't have a 2 in binary. But when we get to the oversampling stage, now there's a problem. Take a look at this. The PCM samples, represented by the squares, are all below 0 dBFS, so no problem, right? But when we actually oversample and reconstruct the intended original analog signal, uh-oh, it goes above 0 dBFS. Even if all PCM samples are below the maximum limit, the reconstructed waveform might not be. Ideally, this wouldn't be a problem. Your DAC should have digital headroom to make sure that it can properly reconstruct any transient or signal that might go above 0 dBFS by referencing the maximum PCM level to about minus 3 dB on the DAC instead of 0 dB. And companies like Cord, Benchmark, and RME do indeed do this. Benchmark has some information about why they've done this, and the DAVE, when in DAC mode, you'll notice, sets itself to minus 3 dB, not 0 dB. So when I play this waveform on the DAVE or a Benchmark DAC 3B, there's no problem at all. It's perfectly reconstructed, and we're just limited by the performance of the DAC itself. But now, let's have a look at one of the highest Synad DACs available currently, the Gustard X18. There is massive distortion chopping off the top of the waveform because it doesn't have any headroom whatsoever. Why didn't Gustard add the extra headroom? Well, quite simply because then they'd be sacrificing about 3 dB of Synad. Unfortunately, when you focus massively on one aspect of performance, other areas often have to suffer. And so it's important to evaluate a product more thoroughly. Synad alone doesn't really tell you much. So what am I trying to say with all this? Should we throw away measurements entirely and go back to 100% word of mouth subjective feedback? No, measurements can indeed tell us a lot, and I wouldn't have bought an analyzer if I didn't think that was the case. I'm making this video both because I think people might find it interesting to get a better view of how some of these measurement systems work, and to warn people that measurements should not be taken as absolute, no matter who they're from. They can be altered, nudged, changed through intention, accident, or simple difference in setup. Not everyone is using the same test hardware, in the same configuration, and so you should always treat measurements as guidelines. Don't go fussing over that last 1 to 2 dB of Synad because it likely doesn't say anything for certain at all, and may have hidden drawbacks. And better yet, don't rely on Synad so much. Synad at 1 kHz is an incredibly limited measurement, and there are so many things which can be different about a device, as evidenced by the fact that even devices with the same very high Synad levels can sound very different. The Rebel Amp and the THX789 can both show close to 115 dB Synad, but if you've tried the two, you'll know that they sound entirely different. I hope this gave you some interesting insight into how measurements may not be as reliable as they seem. If you have any questions or want to discuss this or anything else with me and others, then join my Discord server at goldensound.audio slash discord. Or, if you like this content and you want to help me make more, consider supporting me on Patreon. Patreon support is the reason I was able to get the analyzer and make content like this in the first place. All Patreon income is going towards paying that off, and there will be extra stuff coming in future, like a headphone test setup. Thank you very much for watching, may your air be most wiggly. If you'd like to talk to me and other wiggly air enthusiasts, then join my Discord server. Or if you want to help make more videos like this happen and get access to the private patron chat, then consider supporting me on Patreon or Subscribestar. A huge thank you to my crazy SummitFi supporters, Dizaraster, Dan Mellinger, Fake Aussie Accent, g'day mate, Joe, Chief Big Time, my legend tier supporters, Alex, Chandler Bassett, Chris, CK Yozizawa Zoo, Dwayne Butler and Jithan the Sheba, and my diamond tier patrons Naivotsu, Beefy Fish, Chris Johnson, Clockmeister, Gizmo 1K, Ixnay, King Jung Un, Luxifer, Nick McKay, and Pokey. Thank you guys so much, I could not do this without you.